It was big. Ceilings were low. There might have been a piano in there. We had the run of the whole building, so we were able to put up mics kind of anywhere down the hallways, in the ceilings. You know, there wasn't anybody around at night. In one room was this artist who I had just read about named Dennis Neckbottle. We kept the same hours, you know, start late, work late, and uh, carry on, you know, so. And it was exciting, new energy. More interesting energy than another artist coming up there. And it was active, and so I was quite excited. If you were out in the street, you could hear where we was playing there. We were lucky that across the street was just a big parking lot, so we never really got any complaints from anyone around there. There were no residences in that block. You know, a lot of professional acts might have complained about the lack of soundproofing, but we kind of considered things like squealing bus brakes and diesel truck engines roaring because there was a red light right outside. But, you know, that just adds some good ambience. Remember how long it took to get to the bathroom from the studio? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you had to take a pee, you had to go out through the control room, take a right, go down the hallway, and it was probably about three or four hundred feet all the way to the end of the building. So we would bring our skateboards, because it would take you a few minutes to walk down there and back, so we would just be like... If you're drinking a lot of beer. Yes! <laughs> of beer. And we thought that that's what rock people did. Butch was driving cab, and I was just trying to do smart, and we, you know, we'd get people to come in, and I think it was $25 an hour. We gave away a lot of hours. We were making no money. Steve couldn't even afford to pay his rent, so at one point he moved out of his apartment in, on Space Street and literally moved into the studio, and there was like a closet back in the boiler room, and he just threw all his clothes in there, and he was sleeping on the floor at night. So he would never leave the studio. He, and about every three or four days, he'd go, uh, Butch, can I go use your shower? Every penny that we made, we would save up and buy another microphone, or we would go to these rummage sales and see if we could find something, you know, oh, here's another pair of headphones, let's see if they work, you know, we would buy them for five bucks or 10 bucks. We weren't trained professionals. We just were reacting to the era where you had to have the guy in the disco suit and the, with the Coke spoon um, telling you how to produce your records. You know, we just said, screw that, we're gonna do it ourselves and just figure it out. They were our friends, we trusted them. Just by using them as our, uh, our base to record, gave us a better product and we didn't sound like crap like we could have, you know. We'd be staying up all night making these crazy records and, and then to actually get a piece of vinyl that you could take down to the record store and they would sell it was really exciting. I never thought of it for them as being a hobby because they were there all the time. One could think it was a clubhouse. Anybody could walk through the door and record. They didn't have to always have money. If they had money, great. If they didn't, we usually figured out a way to make it work. There was no sign on the door. They just showed up. OK, the first song I'm going to do is a, is a 1904 hit, which is a very, very famous one. Give my regards to Broadway, remember me at Herald Square. One of the most intriguing and interesting characters to ever grace the studio is Madison's The Singing Irishman. He literally went around town collecting cans, and then he would take them to the recycle center, and I think he did that enough to where he got about 20 bucks together, and he came and knocked on our door said, I would like one hour of recording time, please. Thank you. Of course, we spent a lot more time than that, but I think we only charged them for the one hour. There once was this balloon man from the windy city of Chicago. Selling his balloons of all different colors. The singing Irishman was a big part of what made the studio unique because he was completely and truly original. I've been at it for over 40 years, and I love it. I sing whenever inspiration hits me. 